The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series. A webinar series featuring military leaders and contemporary military authors. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of Education, Lieutenant General Guy Swan. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Thought Leaders webinar series. We appreciate you joining us for this webinar, and while we wish we could all be together here at AUSA, that is currently not possible. So we've crafted a series of events to bring you senior Army leaders, authors, and others speaking on topics of current interest to America's Army, all in a live interactive forum. We're glad you've joined us today, and we appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our great nation. Joining us today to, to discuss his new book is Brigadier General Retired Ty Sigley, the author of Robert E. Lee and Me, A Southerner's Reckoning with the Myth of the Lost Cause. We're also joined by our good friend and great soldier, General Retired Dave Perkins, former Commanding General of the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command, and now a senior fellow here at the Association of the United States Army. General Perkins will moderate the discussion and tell us a bit more about our guest. General Perkins, over to you, sir. All right, well, thank you, General Swan. Uh, it's a true pleasure to be here today to what promises to be a very fascinating and I think very professionally based discussion. Uh, thanks to all the folks out there that have joined us. And for those of you who are with us today, virtually, we want you to be able to take advantage of having General Sedgley uh, a here and his ability to, um, for you to ask questions and for him to provide candid answers. You all can use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen to submit a question. After the author talks to us about his book, we will take as many questions as possible. Also, if you look at the right-hand side of your screen, you will see a handout tab. You can click on the handouts tab and uh, you, what, what will appear are offers to purchase General Sedgley's book that we'll be discussing here today. To introduce our author and main speaker for today, Ty Sedgley is Professor Emeritus of History at West Point, where he taught for two decades. He served in the United States Army for 36 years and retired as a Brigadier General in 2020. He is a Chamberlain Fellow at Hamilton College, as well as a New America Fellow. He has published numerous books, articles, and videos on military history, including the award-winning West Point History of the Civil War. Ty graduated from Washington and Lee University and holds a PhD from The Ohio State University. I will now turn it over to you, Ty. Oh, sir, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I wanna thank AUSA, which is one of the, the gems uh, that we have in the Army to, to be able to talk about difficult subjects uh, for our Army. And so I'm thankful to Lieutenant General Swan and to Joe Craig for setting this up. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about subject that may make some of you uncomfortable. And that's okay because uncomfortable never killed anybody. But our Army is about to go through a process after the National Defense Authorization Act uh, is to change the base names. And I want to I focus on that and tell you a little bit about my book. And with that, uh, could you put the first slide up, please? So I, I put this up here originally because it will make you uncomfortable, and I'm going to go through later and tell you why I've come to this conclusion. Uh, but when I started this process, uh, Lee was the greatest hero in my life. And if I would have, growing up in Alexandria, Virginia, I would have said that Robert E. Lee, on a scale of 1 to 10, was an 11. And even though I went to church every Sunday, I would have put Jesus at about 5. So my understanding of Lee wasn't just that he was a good guy, it was reverential. And I'm gonna tell you about why that is. Next slide, please. So I grew up in Alexandria, Virginia, and you know, home to, and, and Arlington, right near Arlington, the same place that, uh, uh, that AUSA is located, that our Pentagon and our army is headquartered. And the thing that I didn't realize is that it used to be part of Washington, DC. Uh, and that's what George Washington demanded it. Alexandria was his hometown. And, and those little uh, granite or stone uh, pillars are still all around the city. And the reason it, it, so it stayed there until 1847. And then Virginia retroceded to leave uh, the district and join Virginia. And why did it do that? It did it to protect the slave trade. 
And in fact, in 1850, the slave trade was outlawed in, in the capital in DC and Alexandria became the hub for the slave trade. It made all of its money and it forced all of its free black citizens to leave, Cho closed all black churches, closed black schools. And, and, and Alexandria became a hotbed of secessionist talk. And yet it only spent like less than 12 hours in the Confederacy before it was occupied by the United States Army. But growing up with me in, in Alexandria, we had more street named after Confederates than any other city in the South. And the reason is that was a protest against integration in the 1950s and the 1960s. So I grew up in Alexandria uh, believing that Lee was a great man because that's what my white culture demanded of me. Next slide, please. I wanted to be a Virginia gentleman. And so what better place to be a Virginia gentleman than to go to the school of the greatest Virginia gentleman, Washington and Lee University. And that slide on the left, you see me with hair. Those were the days. Oh, look at that hair. Glorious. Too long, but that's the way we rock. That's the way we rocked it in the 1980s. So I'm about to get my commission next to the portrait of my hero, Robert E. Lee in Confederate gray. And then I went a little bit further and that picture on the right, and I received my, my, my commission in front of those Confederate flags. There was one lone US flag, but it was mainly those. And Lee there is, is the altar. That's the apse of the church, the sanctuary. And Lee is the altar and he's about to rise up to, to fight for his people again. He's asleep on the battlefield, dressed in Confederate garb with his hand on his saber, on his sword, ready to fight for the white people of the South. And then I took below, all of you recognize that, that's the oath that we all take. What I didn't realize when I took it, surrounded by Confederate iconography, is that oath was written in 1862 as an anti-Confederate oath. That's right. When it says all enemies foreign and domestic, domestic were the Confederates. Why do you need to, uh, uh, might, might you have a purpose of evasion? Because the traitorous Confederates were infiltrating Washington at this point. So I took an anti-Confederate oath, we all do, and, and, and I took it around Confederate flags. So I was inculcated in this myth of the lost cause. Next slide, please. So what is this lost cause myth? Well, that's the name of my book, uh, the, the Lost Cause. And the Lost Cause was an ideology, a belief system that, that really um, took the Civil War and made it look differently. So if imagine the South went to war to protect and expand slavery. In fact, they wanted to expand it into Cuba, into Mexico, into Latin America. But they lost. They went to war to protect slavery and in, at, by the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendment to the Constitution, ended slavery, gave for equal rights to all Americans and gave black men the vote and could hold high office. So this is what they dealt with that tragic, not tragic, that, that enormous defeat that lost 60 percent of their wealth. So was the war fought over states' rights? No, it was fought to protect slavery. Read the secession documents. They all say that. It says that enslaved people were happy. Well, that's just monstrous. Um, uh, and slavery was about, was the rape. It was, it was murder. It was torture. It was selling families apart for profit. The third one you see there, not true either. The Grant, Lincoln, and the United States Army were the best fighting force in the world. And by the way, I don't use the term union because that makes it seem like the Union Army fought only one war. I use the term U.S. Army because it's the same blue uniform that so many of us wore that Grant wore. Washington chose that blue color in the Revolutionary War. Reconstruction was a failure, also not true, not even close. Uh, Reconstruction brought equal rights to black Americans. 2,000 black men served honorably. We have heard this, that Grant was a butcher. He was by far the greatest soldier of the war. And at the top was the marble man, Lee, the greatest soldier, the finest man who ever lived. All told, this is the lost cause of the Confederacy myth. Next slide, please. There was a purpose for this. The lost cause myth, like Confederate monuments, like Jim Crow segregation, uh, like lynching, all occurred at the same period between 1890 and 1920, and then, and then moving forward as well. And it all supported one thing, which is white supremacy. If we think of Black History Month, we often talk about the first, Benjamin O. Davis Jr. or Benjamin O. Davis Sr., Charles Young, um, of these great uh, black heroes of ours. But the reason they had to be the first is because we had a system of oppression in this country that made sure that white people maintained political power. And Confederate monuments uh, and, and this myth of the lost cause were, were, were symbols, were the pillars, the foundation of that system. Next slide, please. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, about why we have these things named have these 10 posts that are named for Confederates. 
And what I argue here, and you see them on the right there, is what they did. And we named these after the enemy. And I think the second point that I make there is, is something that we should come to grips with. No one killed more U.S. Army soldiers than Robert E. Lee. They killed U.S. Army soldiers. And many of them, some of them never served in Army Blue. So their purpose was terrible, which is to break apart the country that we all have, have, have sworn uh, and spent our lives defending. And they did it for the worst possible reason. And that was to create a slave republic that would, that would enslave 4 million people in perpetuity. That's what their constitution said. The only difference really in the, in the Confederate constitution, the U.S. constitution, is the long-term role of slavery to expand it everywhere. It was a terrible system, a, a, uh, in, my, in my estimation, an un-American system, and one that, thank God, it didn't work. Could you imagine if it had worked? Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of these people that we've named posts after. Uh, and, and, when, and, 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 and then we'll talk about why. So the middle one, John Brown Gordon, a great hero for the Confederates in Antietam, one of the few non-West Point graduates that rose to high command. But after the war, uh, he created and led the Ku Klux Klan, the white terror organization in Georgia. In 1868, he gave a speech to black Charlestonians where he said that, um, yes, we bought and paid for you. That's why we're fighting this war. And if you are to demand equality, we will start a race war and the 40 million of us white people will exterminate the 4 million of you. He later became a Georgia senator and then and governor. And he said, you must vote for me because I will enforce white supremacy now and forever. Um, and bottom left is Henry Benning, uh, never served in the U.S. Army, was a brigade commander in the Confederacy, not that high a rank. Um, and he was picked by the local United Daughters of the Confederacy uh, to have his name. He was one of the largest slave owners in Georgia, uh, and he tried for the dissolution of the United States starting in 1849. Is what we call a fire eater. And he had an apocalyptic version of what the U.S. of what life would be like if black people had the vote. He said, "I would rather have pestilence and famine rather than that." Um, and Braxton Bragg, you see his, he called the old porcupine, was just a terrible general. He was awful. So we named these after a mishmash of people. Polk died on the battlefield and his greatest contribution to the Confederacy was dying a glorious battlefield death because he was so incompetent. Next slide, please. And here are a few more. Um, uh, at the bottom right is George Pickett. Uh, Pickett was a war criminal. He executed, summarily executed 22 U.S. Army soldiers uh, and then at the end of the war, fled to Canada because he thought he was going to be tried for war crimes. Um, uh, Beauregard was the last su superintendent at West Point before the war started. He was superintendent for five days before he was fired for sedition, for, taking, for encouraging young cadets to join treason. And we know that he raped black women. In fact, he had a daughter uh, with a black woman, an enslaved woman, and their great, great, great granddaughter, grandson later graduated from West Point in 2011 uh, from the enslaved side. So these are these are terrible people in my opinion. Next slide, please. So we have these terrible people. Then we have Lee. Now, man, I, I take Lee to the woodshed. I mean, I just, there, there's, there is absolutely no doubt um, because I think he violated the constitution. There's only one crime in the constitution. It's article three, section three. And it says that levying war against the United States is treason. And the founders meant to very, to limit war, limit the, the, the charge of treason so that it wasn't just political speech. But did Robert E. Lee wage war against the United States? Absolutely. He was indicted after the war, never tried because of prosecutorial incompetence, uh, but no doubt that he levied war against the United States. And the next part is, is that he was an outlier. Eight U.S. Army colonels from Virginia in 1861, all West Point graduates, seven remain loyal. And they're famous people um, uh, like George Thomas, uh, like Dennis Hart Mahan. So he was an outlier. In fact, his family thought he would stay loyal and were surprised he didn't. And many members of the Lee family remain loyal to the United States. And when an officer, he was a colonel for three weeks before he chose treason. When an officer uh, in this army of my army, your army, is told to go to war, we go to war. And uh, uh, just because you disagree with policy is no excuse uh, to fight against your country. And he chose treason. Why did he do this? 
Lee was the largest holder of enslaved people in the army. And in fact, for two and a half years, he took paid leave. Winfield Scott, the commander, gave him paid leave. So he wasn't with his regiment in Texas. He was at home running plantations, or as I call them, enslaved labor farms. He was there at Arlington running enslaved labor farms. So I believe that he identified as a slaveholder more than he did as an army officer in those last two and a half years. And he was a cruel person about that. His father-in-law, who he took over from, kept families to, uh, together and recognized enslaved marriages, not Lee. He broke apart almost every family to, to maximize his profit. And we have clear accounts of where he ordered the whipping and pouring salt water on the wounds of enslaved people. And more often, moreover, he was smart. He knew why the, the South was going to war. It was to protect slavery. He fought for a slave republic. Next slide, please. So why did the army name these posts after Confederates? Well, we've got to remember that during World War I and World War II, and for most of the U.S. armies that I love, most of its existence, it was a white supremacist organization. It was racist. So you can read the quote there that Pershing wrote, uh, and he gave away one whole division. The only division he gave away in World War I was the 93rd. The Harlem Hellfighters were a part of that. Fought bravely and unbelievably well for the French in French uniforms. Um, but he was absolutely a racist and, and the segregation and violence against black soldiers during World War I, there were, there were a number of lynchings during this period. So that shows you one thing. And then the bottom shows you the Army War College. And the Army War College was the G5. It was the planners during that period. And they had this during, during, the, um, during this period, they had for like 20 years, uh, they wrote about how to deal with Negro manpower. In other words, how are we going to have black people uh, fight because they believed that they wouldn't fight, despite all the evidence to the contrary. And what I found when I was reading those in AHEC was that, that the army did not think that they were fully human. So that's our army. It's uncomfortable to hear, but we've got to know that. We also named them because we only listened to white people in the South, and the, the South was a racial police state. Black people did protest these names, but they had no voice. They had no ability to, to, to say anything against it. Next slide, please. So here's another problem for us. And uh, if you want to ask more questions, I'm, I'm running low on time. So I'll, I'll just talk about this monument in the center, which is an Arlington National Cemetery. It's the cruelest monument in the country, in my estimation, put there in 1914. It is meant to say that the South was right, slaves were happy, and, and it would have been better if the South would have won. And you see this racist trope on the right of an overweight uh, uh, African-American woman uh, taking the master's baby from her as, as she has a tear in her eye, sending him off to war to continue her enslavement. Um, she's overweight, which is completely a racist trope. In fact, in 1923, uh, Congress came within a couple of votes of putting a 40 foot statue to the Mammy on Capitol Hill. So this is a thoroughly racist uh, want, uh, monument. And you see on the left that we bring the Confederate flag into Arlington National Cemetery, not the national flag, that's not the national flag of the Confederacy. That is the battle flag, the flag of white supremacy. Uh, so it, it is just, it's, complete, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing, particularly with that. Uh, and the army's gonna have to deal with that statue. Next slide, please. So at West Point, and this is where I had my epiphany, is I realized uh, after looking through all, the, all the, 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 the work is that West Point banished the Confederates in the 19th century. On the left is Battle Monument to the War of the Rebellion. Only U.S. soldiers on there. Cullum Hall, no Confederates in there originally either. No Confederates in the West Point Cemetery. Duty, honor, country on the far right was an anti-Confederate motto, country in there. So West Point is absolutely banished them because they were traitors. And uh, Cullum said, he's the one that gave the money for the, the Memorial Hall, I will never forgive those who forgot the flag to follow false gods. Next slide, please. So when did all of the things come to West Point? When did all of these come to West Point? And I lived on Lee Road by Lee Gate in Lee Housing Area. That's really where I, I, my epiphany came. And I was walking one day down past uh, Eisenhower Barracks, past Pershing Barracks, past Grant Barracks, and stopped at that sign for Lee Barracks. And I, oh my gosh, why are there so many things named after Lee? Well, what I found out was that most of the ones, particularly the ones in the 30s, the 50s, and the 70s, were a reaction to integration. In 1930s, black cadets come back for the first time in 50 years, and that's when we name Lee Gate, Lee Road, and the first portrait comes back. It's a reaction to bring black cadets back in the 20th century. 
The one on the far left is a reaction to integrating the army. Remember, the army was supposed to integrate in 1948. It slow rolls it. It, it, it fights very hard not to integrate. And it's only the demands of the Korean War that really allow uh, the, or that force the army under Matthew Ridgway to integrate. And then there's 1970 when Lee Barracks's name is a reaction to minority admissions coming to West Point, uh, going from just a handful of black cadets per class to dozens, excuse me, per class. And then the ones on the bottom left, the one on the left is a, is a reconciliation plaza done by the class of 1961, who I think were raised on the lost cause myth. And the one on the right is particularly galling to me. That's in our honor plaza. That quote, which he wrote in 1864, saying basically his duty is to fight for a slave republic for the South. So these are the things that we have that it, that we're going to change at West Point. Uh, and I know that, that West Point's looking forward to changing these on, in the course of the next year because the National Defense Authorization Act uh, allows it. Next slide, please. The great thing about this is who we can name them after. Uh, one little bit of trivia here, the Medal of Honor, the Army's changed its Medal of Honor, but this still looks very similar to the one that the Navy and the Marine Corps do. In the center is Lady Liberty, Lady Justice, smiting the foul spirit of secession, the South, and the, that, 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 that figure is crouching and holding three serpents. So that's the Medal of Honor. But look, we can name these after Audie Murphy. The one on the bottom right, Ted Rubin, is one of my favorite people. He was a, a Holocaust survivor and then went and fought bravely in the Korean War, was denied the Medal of Honor because of anti-Semitism before he finally got it under President George H. George W. Bush. So we have amazing heroes that fought for their country, for the greatest army in the history of the world. We should recognize those heroes, not people that fought to destroy their country. So I'm excited about the National Defense Authorization Act. I'm excited about the opportunity for the army to recognize its true heroes. Next slide, please. So this is the really the thesis of my book, is you we can't go forward in our army and our nation to expunge the sin of slavery, the sin of segregation without dealing with it and talking about it. And when we do talk about it, we can then move beyond it, but we can't do it before that. So I'm hoping that the army, like the rest of the nation, will start coming to grips with this. And in Black History Month, where we are right now, we talk not only about those great black soldiers who were the first, but we talk about why they had to be the first is because of the racism within the US Army. So I wrote this book to try to help change the Army. In fact, I retired from West Point because I chose to retire because it was too hot a subject for the Army to deal with when I was first talking about it. Now I'm so happy that the Army is ready to deal with that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over uh, to General Perkins. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, thanks for in a fairly short amount of time, covering a lot of ground and giving us a great background of, of why you wrote this, as well as uh, some of the content that's in it. Uh, as we had expected, a lot of great questions already, and we'll try to work through as, as many of these as we can, as time permits. Uh, the first one, I'll start off uh, from Galen, uh, and uh, you alluded to this a little bit, but uh, what he asks is how how is it that the United States Military Academy, an institution that you and I, Ty, are both former faculty members of, one of the most esteemed institutions in our nation, produced so many traitors in the Civil War? Uh, great question. And I looked at this very carefully. I think there are two ways of looking at it. One is that West Point actually produced fewer traitors than did Princeton or Harvard or Yale or the U.S. Supreme Court or the United States House of Representatives or almost any other institution. So West Point had a, was the most national institution in the country leading up to the Civil War. Um, but they did have a lot. It was mainly the younger ones. So the older officers, um, I think it was a, a 10 out of the 12 senior officers from the slaveholding states remained loyal. It was the younger officers that came through. And in fact, this was such a huge issue that twice, once in 1861 and once in 1863, um, Congress voted on whether to shutter West Point completely uh, because of the traitors. In fact, one congressman, one senator on the Senate floor said there has never been an institution that has had more traitors since Judas Iscariot <laughs> than West Point. So this was a huge, huge issue for West Point and for the army and nearly, and it did, it tore the nation apart. Your army, my army is a representation of the nation. We have a great army because we represent a great nation. And when the nation is that torn apart, the army is going to represent it. 
Uh, great perspective uh, put in there. Well, um, from Edward, what what would your recommendation be, or what do you think we should do with all these Confederate monuments that are out there that you've discussed? That's great question. So there are over thirteen hundred. I'm excited that the commission that the NDAA did will look at these in total for the Army. Um, every community has to look at these. And what I did in my book was look at my community. I looked at my hometown, my adopted hometown, my high school, my college, my army, my West Point. And what I did and look at that is, uh, is when I scratched the surface, I found racism uh, endemic and I, I, in, my, in my own life, in me. So what every community has to do is look at its own history and realize why those monuments came up. But we're, we're, not, we're a decentralized country in this respect. They were put up individually. They have to be taken down individually. However, many states, Tennessee, Alabama, first among them, have passed laws that do not allow local communities to take these statues down. And that has to change. But every town that you're in, no matter where town you're in, if you scratch the surface, you will find what I'm talking about. It may be about uh, segregated school systems or segregated housing developments. The state of Oregon, for instance, had its original constitution said no Negroes allowed in the entire state. We all have this history. What we have to do is look at it, open ourselves up for it, and then vote, I believe, for communities to change those monuments so they reflect our values. Remember, monuments reflect not the people that the people they were named for, but who put them up. So those monuments should reflect your community, not community now, not the community 80 years ago. A really basic question. Why, in your mind, is seceding a treasonous act? Because the Constitution says it. I mean, it, I, I, I don't, I'm not making it up. Uh, the Constitution says that fighting against, and the Constitution does not allow, in my opinion, does not allow secession. Um, uh, if you look in the Federalist Papers, it doesn't allow secession. If you look at what had happened earlier, it doesn't allow secession. Now, could the states come back for a constitutional convention and then and then vote to leave in this constitutional convention? Yes, that's not what the Southern states did. They did it unilaterally, and then they seized federal property violently. And that's what they wanted to do. They, it was a violent rebellion. And remember that the Constitution was created uh, after the Articles of Confederation because Washington and, and the, 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 the federal government had no means of putting down insurrection. So Shays' Rebellion in Massachusetts came up, no way to put it down. The first rebellion... Uh, after the Constitution was formed, the Whiskey Rebellion, and what happens? President Washington puts the blue coat back on, gets at the front of the column, and leads 13,000 soldiers to put down that rebellion. Rebellion is what soldiers do. They put down rebellions we always have, and we always will. You don't get to secede just because you feel like it, because you want a slave republic. Um why, in your opinion, was the president of the Confederacy not tried for treason? And I know this is hypothetical, but do you think if he had been, he'd have been convicted? Uh, it's a great question. Um, it, he was in jail for two years, and he, Lee, uh, two of Lee's nephews, um, sons, there were like 35, 40 people that were indicted for treason. And it was just a, it was a prosecutor. They just had made a mess of it. And they're trying to bring people back together. I mean, the fact that they didn't try them was an attempt to bring uh, America back together after this horrible civil war. And, and there is some sense that unlike civil wars in Britain, Spain, and other places, which they knew the history were, were bloody afterwards. And we didn't do that. But what, what the problem of not doing that was that white Southerners did not accept black equality, even though it was the law of the land and they used violent terror to put it down. And that's why Reconstruction Ends is violent terror committed by Ku Klux Klan and their many sister organizations stopped um, uh, black equality. So do I think they should have been tried? Maybe we'd be in a better situation now if that had happened, but I don't know if they would have been convicted. It was a, a matter of who should try them, where should they try them? Uh, and eventually they just ran out of steam and it was prosecutorial incompetence. I'm having trouble hearing you, sir. Um, can, is it better yeah, I got now? You now? Yep, I got you now. Okay. Um, how many of the Confederate soldiers that died for this lost cause, as you call it, were actually slave owners participating in the actual system that they were fighting for? Do you know? Yes. Uh, it's about, about a third 
um, a third to a half, depending on the state. Because remember, it's not as though it's like right now, how many people own homes? Well, you don't say that every 18 year old owned home. You would say how many families own homes. So how many families own enslaved people? It would probably be about a third. But remember, the entire system of the South was based on slavery. It was an entire social system. Um, you know, if any uh, uh, poor white were not on the bottom rung of the, of, the, of the economic ladder, that would have been enslaved people. And they, the white, white slave owners of the time brought other people into this system and people wanted to become slave owners. So it was while that, and if we looked, we have looked at the letters and slavery is chalk through this because they were afraid of what happens if enslaved people become free. So it, while it was not a third owned human beings, the rest were very much a part of that system. Um, Lee died in October of 1870, and he had been in bad health for the last couple of years of his life. Um, do you know what role he had or active role in creating this lost cause myth? Great question. Active role. So it starts uh, before the smoke has cleared on the battlefield. He, he uh, uh, issues General Orders Number 9, which says he lost this war with honor because of the Norse greater material and basically the butchery of generals. And it's an, it, it kind of alludes to the fact that it's an immigrant army, but we have our honor. And the honor that we have means that Lee is unwilling to accept the results. So a couple of days after the war, he says, I don't know. I mean, he says the Negroes, quote, have to be disposed of. He later testifies before Congress and says that um, that that African-Americans uh, should all are not worthy of the vote. They only should be a servant class. Uh, he later says that all all uh, black people should be kicked out of the state of Virginia. And he later writes a manifesto that says equality never. He is very cruel to the, the newly freed people in Lexington, Virginia. Uh, and in fact, Washington College men, uh, that's what it was called at the time, uh, were extraordinary assaulted, particularly sexually assaulted black women routinely in that city. So he never accepted the idea of, of the underlying purpose of, 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 the, of the victory, which is, and the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, which would have been a, a quality of all human beings. Never accepted that. Um, Lori uh, out there writes a wide ranging question here. That there are many agreed parties throughout history. Uh, for example, American Indians were slaughtered by Buffalo soldiers when women couldn't vote for 100 years. Uh, and the question is, should we frame all of this in racism? What about sexism? How do we prioritize aggrieved parties and their grievances against others? And when does it end? And, you know, where do you start and where do you stop? So, um, you know, a pretty wide ranging question. Your yeah, I, I mean, listen, uh, this t this book wasn't about uh, sexism. Uh, sexism. I could have written another book about sexism. Uh, and uh, but I, th that, that would have been another book. There's certainly all many of these problems that we have, uh, but what we didn't have is we don't have memorialization uh, to many of the people that that created the slave republic. We don't have it for people that committed treason and just tried to destroy this country. Uh, so I, I this one is particularly important to me because I grew up on these myths that Lee was the greatest human. It was in my textbooks that Lee was a great human. It was in my textbooks that slavery wasn't that bad. But the, 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 the slavery and the segregation that followed that is a very recent, ended very recently, and we still are dealing with the consequences for this day. So I'm not saying that other issues don't deserve importance, but aggrieved is an understatement when we look at our history of our country. And if we engage with that past, if we engage with the history, if our army does that, starting in basic training, then we maybe can help not have some of the same problems we are doing right now. Joe Austin, um, who, I, I mean, not General Austin, Secretary Austin, um, who's go, is a gr gonna be a great defense secretary, is talking about a stand down to look at extremism within our ranks. Well, part of the things that we have to look at is to create a counter narrative for that extremism. And that is the history of this country. And not just the history of, 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 uh, of, of enslavement, but those great stories of soldiers who fought for their country. So we do need a new narrative. And there are plenty of great American heroes that we can talk about. As a uh, military historian, uh, fellow military historian, would you agree with Alan T. Nolan's assessment of Lee that, quote, Lee's aggressive, offensive generalship caused his army disproportionate, irreplaceable and excessive casualties, which in the end led to him being caught in a fatal siege? 
Yeah, I think so. Really, there, there's a two questions that, and one that I really focused on was Lee, um, who committed treason, uh, Lee, who fought for slavery, which because I thought that hadn't been looked at quite as much. The whole other idea is Lee as a general. And I will admit that when I first started teaching mill art uh, at West Point, I, the smell of gunpowder seduced me. Uh, and I would go to Gettysburg and I would talk about sort of the X's and O's of military history. And I would talk about John Brown Gordon at the Bloody Lane uh, in, uh, in, in, in Antietam. Uh, and I would talk about Lee at Antietam, you know, or, or at Gettysburg. And there are plenty of other historians that talk about Lee as a commander. Uh, he was very aggressive and for most of the war did extraordinarily well until he ran up against a better commander, which is Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, what a great soldier that is. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, and he's finally at West Point in 2019, we put a statue up to, to, uh, to, to uh, Grant, an amazing, amazing man. So it's a long argument to say about, about Lee, the commander, which I think there are positives and negatives for him as a commander, but I don't want the smell of gunpowder uh, the idea of the X's and O's of military history to take away from the fact that he committed treason to preserve slavery. Would you draw a distinction between Confederate statues on the battlefield versus those erected in public areas like town squares and things? I think it depends. So if you go to uh, uh, Manassas, Bull Run, if you go to Bull Run, there is a pic, there is a statue there of Stonewall Jackson that is downright steroidal. I mean, he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, and, and Little Sorrel, his horse, is just jacked. I mean, you've never seen such a muscular statue. It was put there for a reason. And the Lee statue at Gettysburg also is a white supremacist statue. So there's some that aren't, there's some that are. And our National Park Service is doing a really good job of talking about that. I think the more problematic one, and the one that the Army is going to have to deal with, is the one at Arlington National Cemetery. And that is one that uh, it is not going to be easy for the Army to deal with. And I think what, what all of these have, have seen is, I mean, our army couldn't make this decision to change without our political bosses telling us. Real change only comes to the army when our political bosses tell us to change. Integration, uh, co uh, bringing women in. Um, uh, all these changes come when our political bosses force us to. And it's gonna be the same at these battlefields. If the, the, if the people want it to change, they will create a commission around the battlefields and we'll put historians, politicians to look at this. This is a political decision. History is dangerous, and that's a good thing, but but it's going to take a, a another commission to take a look at the battlefields because it's a complex issue. Here's a little bit more of a contemporary question. Uh, you didn't address it in the book, and maybe it's a little bit out of your lane, but it's, uh, it refers back to a previous one we had, and it says, taking the fact that the traitors were not tried uh, in order to promote unity, uh, and maybe that didn't turn out as well as you had commented, um, would you extend that analogy to our current situation with regards to impeachment and um, unity and et cetera? Well, I, I don't think I'll do impeachment because that's sort of a, a political question above my pay grade. And I didn't write about that. But I will talk about insurrection, which is those people that went into the Capitol carrying the flag of treason with them. And there's a, a, a picture that I saw of one of them carrying the flag of treason into the people's house, desecrating it, as far as I'm concerned. And it passes a picture of Charles Sumner. And Sumner was a senator from Massachusetts who was nearly beaten to death on the floor of the Senate with a gold-tipped cane by a South Carolina congressman. And it took him four years to recover from traumatic brain injury. When he came back, he wrote that oath that I'm telling you, that I told you about earlier, the oath we all take. So the idea that insurrectionists came into the people's house, I think, has to be uh, looked at. And a, and we need a sort of 9-11 commission to look at that insurrection, why it happened, why it occurred, and hold people accountable. So the idea of holding people accountable for their actions is something that is a soldier, that is a citizen, that is a scholar, I am fully, a, full, I'm on board with. Um, obviously, this book recently published. Previously, have you shared some of these thoughts with um, West Point cadets? And if so, how were they received? I, I absolutely have. So I wrote on the enslaved experience at West Point. I've written on, uh, there was a, a period, which I write about in the book, um, a period where uh, cadets in 1971 reacted to Nixon coming and Nixon ordered West Point cadets to put a, put a uh, Confederate monument on Trophy Point. Uh, he was doing something called the Southern Strategy to make the South more, white South more Republican. And the cadets, uh, uh, including Lloyd Austin, I might add, 
uh, uh, protested against this, signed a created and signed a manifesto and led to large scale change at West Point, including what we have today, Buffalo Soldier Field. It stopped the monument. Uh, Nixon had to back down because of white because of black cadet uh, pol- pressure on him. And all the uh, almost all the black officers at West Point signed that manifesto as well. So I talked to them about that. And in fact, black cadets started something called Operation Tuskegee, which was instrumental in naming our latest barracks after after Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Uh, over the summer, there were several black and white cadets who are uh, recently graduates who arose and, and uh, Truman Scholar, Marshall Scholars, who wrote something about the problem of racism at West Point. And because of that, General Williams, who I think so highly of, great superintendent, has started an investigation looking at racism there. So the idea that uh, that that at West Point we I have done this over and over again uh, to talk about the history of our institution, and when we understand our past, I think it is more it is more likely that we're going to like the future we get. So while you're at West Point, how about back to your alma mater, Washington and Lee? Uh, the question is, should we change it to Washington and a traitor? Maybe a little bit of a tongue. <laughs> uh, but uh, how does that get addressed and not diminish uh, the contributions and others that did not support slavery? Well, I will tell you that. So uh, the, I gave a speech in 2017, right after the, uh, the white supremacist violence in Charlottesville. I went back to WNL and gave a speech at, in Lee Chapel, framed by his recumbent statue, standing on his grave. Uh, with a Confederate portrait right next to me. And I and I called Lee a traitor for slavery at Washington and Lee University. Oh, Joe Perkins, I was nervous in the service. Let me tell you, to go back to my alma mater and 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 as the as the great writer John Updike said, rub humanity's face in the facts. To 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 tell telling the truth is a ruthless act. But I had to do it. I couldn't I couldn't stop myself. And the reaction there was a standing ovation. Oh my gosh. I felt you know this warm glow of acceptance that they accepted me. But but one speech, of course, doesn't change a university, it doesn't change society. So they're now trying to figure out, do they, you, do they lose that name? And again, it goes to who we are today. We honor people that represent our values. And if they don't represent our values, we can change it. At West Point, uh, on our plane, you know, where, where we, the cadets do their parades, um, there are about a dozen monuments there. There are only two, that, that, and there used to be two dozen. There are only two monuments there that have neither have either been uh, that have always remained the same. Other than that, all of them have either been moved, altered, or changed. So we can change things. We're Americans. We love change. There's nothing wrong with change, particularly if it makes our society a more just society. If it makes our army a more equal society. We have way more questions than we have time to answer. But in the interest of time. I'll kind of wrap up uh, with the last question here, kind of looking towards the future. And that is, as the commission looks at renaming uh, military posts and and, and sort of um, taking a fresh look at this, how should they think about this? What should they think about? How should they go about doing it uh, so that they make decisions that will sort of stand the test of time? Well, one of the great things about our army is its diversity. So, you know, we are the most uh, diverse, like at Fort Lee, the home of army logisticians, uh, the greatest logisticians in the history of the world uh, is 50% African-American and minority white. So our our army is great because it represents the diversity of our nation. The commission must represent the diversity of our nation as well. And so that's the first thing that we need to do. The second thing is we're going to have dozens, hundreds of possible names uh, to name these, uh, 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 everything African. Fort Hamilton has a Lee Street and a, and a Stonewall Jackson Street. So we've got more than just uh, the post names to look at. But the other part that has to come into there is the education part. And, you know, I, I was thinking about, uh, sir, when you were TRADOC commander, is that some of the things that maybe we need to think about, uh, both for our nation and particularly for our army, is how do we educate and train our soldiers about the diversity of the United States Army? And that we 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 give them some of this information early in their their service so that they know about it. So I think part of it is is to get a diverse commission that represents the values of the United States as we are now, and it should represent who we are as a nation now. The second thing is it's got to be a part of an education campaign to educate American citizens, to educate the army, to educate the military on who we are. And who we are is a great story, but it's not a perfect story. But I think what the commission allows us to do is like the Constitution says, 
is that we have the chance to get toward a more perfect union. And that's my hope and really my dream uh, that the commission can help us do in the Army and in the nation. I just want to thank everyone. I had a wonderful time. Thank you, General Perkins. Thank you, General Swan. Great. Gentlemen, thank you very much. What a fascinating discussion today that we could go on for hours talking uh, about this topic. Yeah, you've given us a lot to think about here, probably more than we can handle right now. Um, one of the things I take away from the discussion is is something that we overlook, uh, we take for granted uh, so often in the military, and that's our oath. Uh, our oath that we all take when we come into service to the nation and how important that is. And maybe it's a good time for all of us to kind of reflect on, on the oath that we've all taken. So thanks, Ty, very, very much for uh, the contribution you've made with this book. Before we part, I want to bring everyone up to date on some upcoming AUSA events. Noon report will be on the 24th of February, where we will host the Army's Talent Management Task Force, which will be talking about enlisted uh, talent management, uh, talent management for the enlisted force. Our next the AUSA Thought Leaders event will be on the 25th of February, where we'll host author James Carl Nelson, who's written the book, The York Patrol, the real story of Alvin York and the unsung heroes who made him World War I's most famous soldier. This is a story about the soldiers around uh, Sergeant York uh, in, in his great World War I battle. And then on the 10th of March, uh, we'll host a noon report with Lieutenant General Laura Potter, She's the Deputy Chief of Staff, G2, the Chief Intelligence Officer for the U.S. Army, and she'll be talking about the vision for the Army's intelligence enterprise. And lastly, don't forget, 16 to 18 March, 16 to 18 March, will be the AUSA Global Force Next Symposium. Uh, lots of great speakers talking about Army modernization at Global Force Next, 16 to 18 March. Those are just some of the great speakers and events that we have coming up for you, and you can get more. And then finally, thank you to all of you for your membership in AUSA. Your membership really does count, and it helps us support the world's greatest army. So thanks for again for attending this very important discussion, and have a great Army Day.